Hey everybody, welcome to The Cut Block. I'm your host, Dan Pierce, and today we're going to be looking at the absolutely devastating flood that hit Texas last week on July 4th. I'm going to be pulling together a bunch of the science as well as some of the reporting that's been done, trying to get to the bottom of what the root causes of this disaster were, looking at the landscape features, looking at the climate impacts, looking at some of the policy failures where we were building in places where we probably shouldn't have been building, and talking about some of the solutions that we need to be looking at, long-term solutions for mitigating the risk of these disasters moving forwards. Let's jump into it. Let's turn to some of this absolutely gobsmacking imagery of the flash floods that struck Texas in the Guadalupe River. And the first thing that you notice as I hit play on this video is just how quickly the waters rise. I mean, that happens in just a matter of minutes. Let me rewind it because it kind of gets to this point and it levels off. It sort of peaks here. But if I go back to the beginning, you know, it goes from being this kind of trickle of a river at the start and raising, you know, it, I think it got up to like 30 feet or something like that when it reached its peak. This next video here, it's not a time lapse, but you can really see the water first arrive at this location. And there was almost nothing in the stream bed. I mean, Texas had been in a drought, a prolonged drought. And you can see very quickly the water levels are rising the amount of debris that's rushing down it's pulling trees down and if you were to get sucked into those waters i mean you don't have much hope the next thing i want to talk about is the landscape because this is really where all those flood waters originate from is water falls all over the hills all over the canyons and it runs off the hillsides and into those channels and into those creeks and tributaries that carry it down into the guadalupe river we sit in flash flood alley this is not something that's debatable uh, we lose more people here in flash flooding than just about anywhere else in the country on an annual basis. And this year is going to be, well, it's a disaster. Why is the whole country, why is the IH-35 corridor such a problem area? There are three things that contribute to that. And the first is very obvious based on what you said, and that is it is the Texas hill country. <laughs> and we have very hilly environment. It's a beautiful environment. Unfortunately, number two now in those hills, in many cases, the soil layers are very shallow. It's a very it's a rocky limestone that comes almost to the surface. Well, the problem with that is when you start getting these excessively heavy rains, it hits the ground, the hills will cause it to go downhill. And guess how much of that water will soak in in a, in a flooding rain? Very little because of the limestone layers. We also, on the I-35 corridor, we are putting in so much impervious cover where we are laying down concrete our urban growth in the city of austin this is the thing that scares me to death why because upstream on shoal creek there's no more cattle land it's all parking lots how much of that water soaks into the asphalt or into the concrete none of it does so this guy nails it and i'll post the link to this video in the description below but just to touch on the key points that he made there, you've got a really hilly landscape. There's very little absorption. It's just total surface runoff across the entire landscape. And that's why they call it Flash Flood Alley. But I feel like the third point that he makes is the most important point, And that's the urbanization and the alteration of the natural landscape by human activity building roads and ditches and parking lots, and it's gonna increasingly make these floods worse and worse over time. So we've looked at the landscape. Let's talk about this storm. The storm that caused the Guadalupe River to flood on July 4th and all the way through the 7th was a mesoscale convection complex fueled by the remnants of Tropical Storm Barry, which had just come across from the Gulf of Mexico, and moisture from a mid-level trough. And we're seeing a satellite image of what was happening here. I've marked in yellow, and you can see them located right over here. Marked in yellow, that's Kerr County. That's ground zero for the event. And you can see right now it's not there, but watch. That system is going to impact, and boy, now they're ground zero for that storm. 
and they're under that storm through the worst part of it. Now, the next thing I want to jump to here is we're going to zoom in on this area of the Guadalupe River that we call the headwaters. This is like the origin of where the this river system flows from, right? So this is coming in, this is in the Texas Hill Country, and you'll notice that uh, you've got on the left here, you've got a north fork of the Guadalupe River, and down here you've got a south fork of the Guadalupe River, and these two forks come together and converge at the confluence uh, around Hunt. This is what it looks like. We understand that this is part of the watershed, so all the water that is going to be landing in this area is going to go straight into those creeks that are there. So the question is, is where did the water actually land? Well, we have meteorological data, and we're going, we can layer that on top of this image. And there it is. The pink or purple pink that we have in here is about six inches that fell over a three hour period, a little over six and a half inches roughly. Ground zero for this is the South Fork Guadalupe River and a little bit of the North Fork of the Guadalupe River. Uh, this is where all this rainfall came in. Any water that fell in here is going to hit those vertisols. The vertisols are going to seal up and immediately start diverting that water off the surface and straight into the river. So everything that falls in here, six and a half inches of water over that entire region, dumping straight into those channels at very high velocity. That's going to have a dramatic effect on the water levels of those creeks very quickly. So basically, the location of where this storm happened to land is really really relevant and also its spatial extent normally when we think about rain we only think about rain in terms of its local effect on us is it raining on me what we don't often think about is the fact that that amount of rain you know and when you think about six inches of rain i mean that is a massive downpour but you can't just think about it in a localized way you actually have to multiply that outwards across a massive spatial extent and all of that water is dumping right into the headwaters over a prolonged duration and now that water has nowhere to go but down the river here all right now so far we've been talking about this in terms of the weather factors and the landscape factors that con contributed to the scale and the magnitude and the duration of this flood and why it was so destructive. But there's a whole other dimension to this that we have to factor in, which is the land use, right? Where did we build structures? And, you know, one of the absolutely devastating realities of this is that Camp Mystic, which has been a focal point of this because of all these young girls who died this camp was sitting at very high risk of just such a flash flood. The National Flood Insurance Program has long known that this is a flood zone, a special flood hazard area. Camp Mystic is located right here. Here's the South Fork of the Guadalupe River moving right through here. The water would have moved in this direction here. Here's a major floodway. And in fact, they even have surveyed in the elevation points for the base flood elevation for a hundred year flood. Uh, for these major events, the buildings, the dormitories were located right here, right along this building where most of the people were impacted. Most of the children were impacted, unfortunately. So it would have been long known that this was an area that would be impacted by a severe flood. When was this information known? Well, it had been known since at least 1987. My understanding is another flood had come through here in 1978. And yet there's still this summer camp here with children, 750 children staying at this camp. This was not the only camp that was impacted. There were several camps along there and there were, there were fatalities at the other camps as well. But just the idea of public policy of letting 750 children spend the night in a canyon that is known for catastrophic flooding is an, it's, it's problematic. So just to build on that, let's look at some of the reporting that's been done on what this guy's saying here. FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, removed dozens of Camp Mystic buildings from the 100-year flood map before expansion, records show. 
The Federal Emergency Management Agency included the prestigious girls' summer camp in a special flood hazard area in its national flood insurance map for Kerr County in 2011, which means it was required to have flood insurance and face tighter regulation on any future construction projects. In response to an appeal, FEMA in 2013 amended the county's flood map to remove 15 of the camp's buildings from the hazard area. After further appeals, FEMA removed 15 more Camp Mystic structures in 2019 and 2020 from the designation. Experts say Camp Mystic's request to amend the FEMA map could have been an attempt to avoid the requirement to carry flood insurance, to lower the camp's insurance premiums, or to pave the way for renovating or adding new structures under less costly regulations. So, I mean, this is just a classic case of camp management trying to cut corners, skirt the regulations, and be exempted from very common sense flood safety measures, rules and regulations that are meant to protect the camp's attendees, all in an effort to lower their costs, lower their insurance premiums, or be able to expand in order that they can make more money. Now let's talk about the elephant in the room. Let's talk about climate change because while it's difficult to say that any given storm was a direct result of climate change, I think that at this point we can say that storms like this are becoming way more frequent, way more intense, way more destructive. Even now, before proper attribution studies have been done, there's a lot that we can say. So this is from Climate Central. So first of all, you have uh, warmer air able to hold more moisture and resulting in more intense rainfall. You have climate change making the pre-existing drought conditions more likely to occur. And of course, you have just the frequency of these events becoming more likely to occur over time because of climate change. And the last thing I'm going to share with you here is uh, this op-ed in the New York Times, which is called simply Stop Building in Floodplains. Now, let me just say off the top, of course, easier said than done. There is a lot of building that has already taken place in floodplains. And a lot of the what we used to look at as floodplains that had an acceptable amount of risk are now facing a much higher risk with climate change and, of course, with all of the land use and development that's happening in the area, right? So essentially... You know, one of the things we have to think about here is that not only have we built in floodplains, but all of that building that we've done in floodplains, that which is now at risk, has actually made the risk worse. So where you're building roads into watersheds, where you're building ditches into watersheds, where you're basically removing vegetation from the land, all of that has an effect on the hydrology and makes it more likely that these flash floods are going to happen. So bottom line, we're going to have to figure out how to coexist with these river systems in this new age of flooding. We're going to be living in a world where those hundred year floods are happening every other year or the thousand year floods are happening once a decade, right? So it's just not going to be practical to live in some of the most risky floodplains anymore. And so we're going to have to do some sort of a managed retreat, right? We're going to need to restore these floodplains so that they're actually able to allow the river to breathe and to store water when the flood waters rise without destroying an entire community and taking people's lives. At the same time, we have to think about what we're doing in the uplands as well, right? We can't be spending all this money on flood infrastructure and solutions in the downstream areas while continuing to do all this damage in the upstream, logging forests, building roads, building shopping malls and parking lots. Like that is just going to negate all that good work that we're doing in the downstream. So what we do in the low-lying areas has to be synchronized with what we do in the uplands. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you for tuning into the Cut Block. And I'd also like to invite you to go check out my new film, Trouble in the Headwaters. It's a 26-minute documentary all about the 2018 Grand Forks flood in the interior of BC and how that flood was connected to significant clear-cut logging in the headwaters of the Kettle River Basin. That's on the Narwhals YouTube channel. I'll post a link to that down below. And uh, yeah, thank you again for tuning in. Uh, 
uh, be sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if you like this content, uh, go over to my Patreon page and become a member, support this work, and I hope to be doing this more regularly and more consistently, but I can't do that without your support. So thank you again for tuning into the Cut Block, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.